All right, goodbye, kids. Enjoy Firehouse. Enjoy your time worshiping Jesus in the Firehouse. I love the Firehouse. I'll say this, uh, Priscilla, I appreciate the breakfast this morning and the whole kitchen crew, but you know what? I just feel a little sluggish right now. Um, biscuits and gravy, cinnamon rolls. Oh, wait, my wife's here. Uh, whatever else I ate this morning was good. So, Lord, give me some energy now, all right? So, here we go. Here we go. 2024. Who's excited for 2024? Anybody? Who's, <laughs> who's not excited for it? Be honest. Uh, ah, Michael, okay. So, I want to begin the year where I think that every believer should start their day. And that's in a spirit of worship. You should start your day in a spirit of worship. Psalm 95, 6. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker, for He is our God. And we're the people of His pasture, the sheep under His care. Yes, Jesus is the Good Shepherd, and we are His sheep. And so this month, I will tell you straight up, this month, the theme, the focus is worship. This morning, we're going to focus on your personal worship of Jesus, how to worship Him personally, when to worship Him personally. You're called to do that. Next Sunday, we're going to focus on corporate worship, which is what this is. This is a bunch of believers assembling together to worship Jesus. Very simple. January 21st, another reminder. We're going to have a unified worship service where three or four other churches. It's just a little quick snapshot of what worship will look like in heaven. There are no denominations in heaven. And there's only one preacher. It's Jesus. I can't wait for that day. How about, how about you guys? That's on January 21st, 10 a.m. at the Mattoon High School. And we will close out the month of worship with our own teaching, Ed Taylor. And who's ready for Ed Taylor? I am. I've never heard him preach. Uh, and he's going to preach on the Sabbath and what the Sabbath means for the Christ follower. I'm excited. Uh, so this month, worship, February, get ready, it's evangelism. So let's talk about worship real quick. I looked up the, the Webster definition of worship, and here it is. To lift someone up in high esteem, to attribute great worth and honor to someone who's deemed worthy of actually being worshipped, held high above others. Now, in today's culture, you're very well aware of this. In the American culture, we have people worship. We have people that we call pop icons that you could say are somewhat worshipped. Let me give you a couple examples. Millions upon millions of Americans follow the every move, hope for the chance to lay eyes upon, can't wait to listen to, can't wait to touch the, the hem of the garment of, of a Taylor Swift or a Beyonce. And you could say at times they are worshipped sadly. I will tell you this morning, Christ followers, no human is actually worthy of worship. There is no one who does good. No, no one. We're all sinners saved by grace in Christ. Can a person be cheered for and adored? For sure. But in the truest form of worship, no, no human is to ever be worshipped. As Christ followers, there is only one who is to be worshipped, one who is to be in held in high honor. There is only one which you should be hoping to touch the hem of his garment, touch his hand, kiss his hand, listen to him speak verbally, and that would be the person of Jesus. And the question today I must ask every believer is, do you truly worship him? I know you're in church today, and I appreciate that, but do you worship Jesus on a personal level? What does it mean to worship Jesus? It sounds simple. The biblical definition of worship is actually to bow down to lift up. I've heard Jane Kepley, she gave this definition, and it's accurate. The Greek word for wor worship is proskuneo, and it has about four or five different meanings in the Greek. Here they are. It does mean to bow down to someone. It means to kneel before someone. 
It means to adore someone, to honor them with extreme emotion. It even means, literally, to kiss someone, to kiss the hand of someone. Psalm chapter 2, we read and we hear of the prophecy of the coming Messiah. And it says, kiss the hand of the king. So that's an act of worship as well. Let me distinguish for you the difference between worship and praise and praying. When we pray, majority of you, when you pray, you probably are praying petitions. Lord God, get me this job. Lord God, get me out of this relationship. God, get me into this relationship. When we pray, we're usually petitioning God. And we are preoccupied with our needs. Nothing wrong with that. God is a good father. When we praise God and give him thanks, we are preoccupied with our blessings. Lord God, thank you for not a Christian church. What a blessing. But when we worship, we are preoccupied only with God. Not petitioning, not thanking, thanking. We are just focused on God himself. And so worship is all about God and not about me. It's not about you. And you can worship God in a different facet of an array of things. You can worship Him in prayer. You can worship Him in the Word. You can worship Him in silence. But He is to be worshipped on a personal level. Do you do that? Let me give an example of what I call personal worship that I experienced. October 18th of 2023, I'm driving to church to work. And I experienced what I would call an emotional time of worship. And there's nothing wrong with some emotionalism in your Christianity. I'm going to tell you straight up. It was so emotional that I wrote it down in my Bible in today's passage in Luke chapter 7. I wrote down in my Bible, October 18th, what a worship service. I was singing Holy Forever by Chris Tomlin. That's a song that Jess and Johnny sang uh, last Sunday. I was worshiping Jesus by song. I was not petitioning him. I was not asking for anything. I was not praying for anybody. I was not thanking God for anything. I was just worshiping him. And as I began to sing that song, the words, the lyrics changed. Johnny, you want to come on up? So I, I'm going to sing this song, but you know what? I asked Johnny to sing it with me. I've never done a duet with Johnny, so I've asked him just to, to try and stay with me. And don't sing off tune. Do you want to get a mic? Uh, sure. Please get a mic so he drowns me out. <clears throat> We've not rehearsed this, so. I like to put people on the spot. Y'all good? I'm good. Okay, here we go. So I'm going to start. You just chime in with me, really. <clears throat> and the angels cry, holy all creation cries, holy, you are lifted high, holy, holy forever. And then I change the lyrics, and I start singing this. I cry, holy, I cry, holy. I cry, holy, holy forever. Thank you, brother. <laughs> and so what's happening in my little 2007 Toyota Corolla is I'm singing and I'm crying at the same time. And then the song ends and I'm singing that I cry holy. And then I just get quiet. And I just sort of sense the Holy Spirit saying, Steve, be quiet. Just be quiet and let God speak to you. And in the quietness of my worship, because you can worship God in quietness, right? Be still and know that I'm God. That still small voice will speak to you. And my worship is reciprocated with, I think, God's warmth. And I feel it. I know that sounds charismatic and experiential, but it was. And it was really God reassuring me, Steve, I love you. I know you're worshiping me. I know you love me, so be quiet and let me tell you that I love you. And that took place. You can experience that. Worship places you deeply in the presence of God's throne room, in His presence. 
If you go back to the story of the woman at the well, which I love, John chapter 4, the five-time divorcee, when he gets to the well, halfway down that passage, you know what he tells the woman? And she's concerned, well, us Samaritans worship in this temple up here, and you Jewish people worship God down here in Jerusalem. And Jesus says, no, no, no. The time is coming where, where you worship won't matter. It won't matter if you worship in a building or a temple or a synagogue because true worshipers will worship in spirit and in truth. And when you think about what did Jesus mean by you will worship in spirit and truth? I think spirit is some emotionalism. I think it's with feelings. I think it's with happiness and joy and tears. And truth is grounded in the Word of God. And so if you're a worshiper of Jesus, you need to have a blend of both spirit and truth. It's okay to raise a hand. It's okay to shed a tear. It's okay to kneel at the altar. If there's too much spirit, it can actually lead to a really shallow, quick time of worship that might just fade away quickly. But if you're all just about truth, and this is what the Word of God says, and I'm, I'm going to be silent, that can lead to a, a, a joyless time of worship. So there must be a blend, I think, of, of what Jesus calls worshiping in spirit and truth. All Christians are called to worship personally with Jesus. And you're all called personally to attribute to Him great worth and great honor because He is worthy. So this morning I want to take a look at an extreme example of personal worship that was given to Jesus in front of other people that didn't believe in Him. And it's by a very, very sinful woman. Here we go. And this is how to experience personal worship. Luke 7. We're going to be in Luke chapter 7 this morning. If you have your Bible, starting in verse 36. One of the Pharisees, his name is Simon, one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him. He went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. I like that word, recline. A woman in that town who lived a sinful life learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house so she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume, and that was very expensive fragrant oil. So first, let's do an investigation of who's at the dinner party, shall we? This gathering of guests. To start with, guess who's there? Guess who is holding this party, has organized it? It's the Pharisee. You know who the Pharisees are. They're the known enemies and antagonists against Jesus. The majority of them don't like him. They don't believe in him. But for some reason, this Pharisee Simon sends out the invite, Jesus, come have, come have dinner with me. And there's another guest list. Other people are invited. We're told that at the end of the passage. More than likely, guess who else is there? If you're a Pharisee, you invite other Pharisees. There are other Pharisees there. There are probably some legal experts in the law there and probably some close friends. That makes up part of the list. And then out of nowhere, this Pharisee invites this former building contractor, Mason Carpenter, and now supposed rabbi and healer. And what blows my mind is Jesus graciously accepts the invitation. I do like that he has a recliner. <laughs> but he accepts the invitation from people that he knows as a whole don't like him. And I'll tell every Christ follower today, you probably have people that don't like you, but if you ever give the invite to have a conversation with them, accept it graciously. I thought about the invitation by this Pharisee, and I'm like, what were his intentions? I mean, seriously, he's a Pharisee, he's not a dummy. Were there, was it a good intention, or was it a bad intention to invite Jesus to the dinner party? And for me, it's very questionable. I think we'll get to the answer later on. Regardless of the intent of the invitation, Jesus knows one thing, guys, and some of you know this exact thing about some of your family and friends. Jesus knows these Pharisees and these legal experts in the law, lost in legalism, they're lost. They're without hope. And they need good news just like anyone else. Yes, the Pharisees need good news, and some will come to follow him. Let's go to John 3, 16, shall we? For God so loved the world. For God so loved the Pharisees. For God so loved the legalists. For God so loved the atheists. 
For God so loved the liberals. For God so loved the conservatives. You get my drift? God's love includes everyone, regardless of where they stand with him. If you've never given your life to Jesus today, there's probably someone here today, and you never truly surrendered Jesus, guess what? Your rejection of him does not deny his love for you. That's grace. Regardless of the company that you might find yourself in, look for opportunities to bring up the topic of Jesus. Bring up the good news of Jesus. So we got, here's, here's those who are invited. Quite a collection of men. And then we get an uninvited guest. And this guest, I'm going to use some baseball references to my baseball fans today. This guest has three strikes against her as she walks into the dinner event. Number one, as she walks into the house of a Pharisee, she, number one, is a woman. Guys, women were third-class citizens during the day of Jesus. Uh, if they witnessed a murder, they couldn't even testify. Women. Number one, strike. She's a woman. Number two, she's a sinful woman. And strike three, she doesn't have an invitation card. So what are you doing here, sinful woman? Jewish and rabbis, guys, beware of religion. Jewish rabbis and Pharisees did not speak to women publicly nor would they ever be caught sharing a meal with them. That was below them. A sinful woman, now we are ramped it up, a sinful woman in the first century, guys, she's not considered sinful because she's a robber or a thief or a murderer or an extortionist. She's considered a, wo a sinful woman because you know why. She's probably slept around, and most scholars believe this woman is a prostitute, no, I don't believe she's Mary Magdalene, but this woman is probably a woman of the night. And she barges in into this dinner occasion held by and attended by the religious right, those with religious wisdom, and oh, by the way, the Son of God. Wow. What a dinner table that must be. Son of God, sinful woman, and religious people. Yeah, that's neat. My question is, how does she get in in the first place? If she's a woman, sinful woman, and has no invitation. How does she get into the house? Well, let me give you some background. Most Jewish homes, there was a home, and then there was a, like an outer courtyard. You, we might call it an open-air patio where they entertain guests. And more than likely, this is an open-air patio, and she's walking by, and she's heard that Jesus is going to be there. She's got wind of it. She might have witnessed the raising of the dead boy in the city of Nain just a few months ago. So she's like, i got to get to Jesus. And so she probably walks into this open patio area. Unannounced. So how does she get in, and how does she stay? Here's what I think as I read the passage. I think... Jesus had something to do with this woman being allowed in and being allowed to stay. I believe with all my heart it's the way that Jesus looked at her. Guys, you know what that means. It's the way that Jesus treated her. There have been two different looks when that woman entered that patio. The Pharisees, it would have been a look down their nose. Sinful woman, get her out here. Jesus, his eyes were full of grace. And so I think Jesus had much to do with this woman being allowed in and being allowed to stay. And the reason being is because the grace of Jesus and the compassion of Jesus is always flowing from his person. Guys, let the grace of God and the compassion of Christ let it ever be flowing from your person. It's almost to me as if Jesus almost invites her in and says, she's with me. This sinful woman is with me. And I think it's just the power of the grace, of his grace. And I think it's just the power that he is the son of God that these Pharisees stay silent for a while. Let me ask you this morning, who are you inviting to your table? What non-believer, someone without Christ, are you going to invite to the coffee house and buy them coffee? What non-believer, someone lost looking for hope, who are you going to invite to a church service where they might hear the gospel, where they might see the love of Christ? Who are you going to offer grace to this week? 
when you might think they don't deserve it. I'm going to say it again. Be bold in your invitations for someone to meet Jesus. And then we see this woman. Oh my gosh, she just, she's front and center, my guys. She's front and center. And we see how she experiences a personal time of worship with Jesus. Guys, we are going to learn from a sinful woman. We're going to learn from a prostitute how to worship Jesus. Is that not amazing? It's called grace right there. Grace. It's called the power of the love of God. You want to have a personal worship experience with Jesus? You've got to seek him out at all costs. The sinful woman's intent to get to Jesus, I think, was fueled by a couple things. I think it's fueled by pure worship. I want to worship him. I heard he's the Messiah. She could care less who's there. She knows they're going to look down their nose at her. She knows she's going to be judged. i got to get to Jesus. I don't care what people say. I don't care what people think. I'm getting to Jesus. And I think her barging in uninvited, I think it included a heart of repentance. Lord, I've lived a sinful life. I don't want to live that way anymore. Here I am. I repent. I think it's a time of confession. I am a sinner. Lord, I need you. And I think it's a, it's a step of faith. Her walking into that patio was a step of faith. We're told in verses 48 and 50, she gets saved that day. She gets saved. Isn't that amazing? Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. He didn't say that to any of the Pharisees. You know why? Because they're all mangled up in religion. She just wanted a relationship, and she came to worship, and she got saved. If you're going to have a personal time of worship with Jesus, you've got you to seek him out at all costs. Deny the news media. Deny your breakfast. Deny whatever. Get to him. Be intent. And then we see, this is what I call extreme worship. And this is where I, I say that this woman now, what I call, hits for the cycle. Verse 38, as she stood behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. And so what she's doing, he's probably reclining at a, at a small table. They had real, like small reclining couches, not this big long bench. And she probably comes in behind him, recognizes him, and then she moves to the side, and she kneels down, and she starts. She just kneels first. She just kneels first at his feet. And I don't know what the other dozen Pharisees are thinking, but nobody stops it. I love that. Nobody interrupts her worship. Then she wiped them with her hair. That would be his feet. And kissed them and poured perfume on them. After she was wetting his feet with her tears. In baseball terms, she is now starting to hit for the cycle. The single. Hitting for the single. She bowed down. She knelt before Jesus. In the Bible, kneeling is always a sign of reverence and honor and worship. If you remember the story of the ten lepers who were healed, Jesus said, guys, go back to the Jewish priest and show them your healing and get cleansed. They all walk back and they're all healed. Guess what? Only one leper comes back. And he comes back in a spirit of worship. We, hear, we see what he does. He comes back to Jesus. He drops to his knees in the dirt. And he says, oh my God, my, my Savior, thank you. And so kneeling and bowing is a physical sign of worshiping someone. Bow down to lift up. When was the last time that you have ever knelt in prayer or knelt in a time of worship? Are we too good to kneel? Is it too bothersome? I don't need to. No, you don't need to, but you get to. The double. Hits for the double. Here she goes. She adored Jesus. I love this. When was the last time that you wept so much that your tears that fell from your face and from your cheek actually begin to make puddles? She is actually crying so much that the tears from her eyes are hitting his feet and creating really dark spots because his feet haven't been cleansed yet. His feet are dirty and dusty. You ever seen when raindrops hit a dirt, a, a dirt section of your yard and it gets all muddy and yucky? That's what's happening to the feet of Jesus because the tears are falling. She's crying that much. What's she weeping about? We, we men think we shouldn't weep. Uh, 
I tell you what, weeping and crying is a sign of adoration. Here we see it. The weeping at his feet, it could have been a combination. I think it's a combination of a repentant heart. Jesus, you know I've lived this way and I don't want to live this way anymore. I confess my sins, but I think truly her heart, she's weeping out of joy and wonder that she's actually in the presence of Jesus. I'm in the presence of Jesus. It's crazy. Thank you. I'm in the presence of the one who can forgive my sins, who can lead me to a new life, who won't look down upon me, and who will care for me. No matter how dark my sins are, and she had many dark sins, and the reason she knows this is because she's at the feet of the man who's full of grace and truth. Now, I think she's saying in the back of her mind, I'm with Jesus, he's going to make it all right. He's going to make it all right. The way I lived for the last 10 years, he's going to make it all right. He's going to give me a new path, a new life. He's going to make me all right. And he does. Have you considered lately how great the amount of grace that has been poured over your soul that you might have life eternal? Do we take it for granted that grace happened to the cross and it was painful? Have you, ever, have you considered lately how great Jesus loves you? Let me talk about the tears and the hair of this woman. You know, I have a daughter, Sean, or Sailor, whose hair is way down here. Abby has long hair. This woman had long hair. And she actually used her tears and her hair as actually instruments of worship. This is all about worship. Here's what's happened when Jesus walked into the house. You take off your shoes. You know, some homes, are you guys, hey, take your shoes off? Or some homes like, walk on in. We just sort of walk in her house and leave our shoes on. But in that day, you took your shoes off or your sandals off. The sandals of Jesus have already been removed as he's at the table. And as she is weeping, and as she's crying, and as those feet are being darkened by her tears, Jesus reminds the Pharisee of something that he'd forgotten about common etiquette. The Pharisee offered Jesus no water to clean feet, which was the custom. I came into your house, Simon. You did not give me any water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. And really saying, you don't know me, and you don't love me, and she does. And really, when I think of that act, can you consider someone weeping so much? And Anybody here with long hair want to come up and wash my bare feet with your hair? Doesn't that sound odd, but that's what's happening here. Who's going to wash my feet? I asked my wife if she would come up here and wash my feet this morning, and she said, let's just reverse it. I'll come up and you wash my feet and then massage them. I'll think about it. (laughs) So this woman, as an act of worship, she's cleaning feet with with whatever Jesus walked upon that day, and I will remind you the roads were dirt and animals were used for transportation. That's taking place. Do you know she's also breaking Jewish law? A woman was not allowed to let her hair down. This woman's got one of those big old apostolic buns going on. And she takes the clip out and down goes the hair. And she starts washing the feet of Jesus with her hair. And she's actually cleaning feet that someday will carry a cross that will pay for her sins and my sins. Oh, that we might have the love and adoration of Jesus like the sinful prostitute did. You know what? I know her past, I get it, but man, she loved Jesus and she kept loving him. You know, I thought about her unashamed ability to worship Jesus regardless of whoever was present. The, the people with the most religious minds of the day were present, and she didn't hesitate to worship Jesus. How many here this morning will adore Jesus before a meal of Burger King today? We think that's such a small thing. We don't say a prayer before a meal to say, look, I'm a Christian. You just do it because you love Jesus. How many are ashamed to say a prayer at a meal in public? This woman did it at the feet of Jesus without getting any food. Be adorers of Jesus. She hits for the triple by kissing the feet of Jesus. Wow, that's extreme. In that culture, that was sort of the norm. Kissing a guest on the cheek or possibly the hand was a sign of great respect, adoration. It was affection, sometimes submission. You're welcome here. Paul wrote, greet one another with a holy kiss. That was a culture. The Pharisee offered Jesus none of this. 
none of the proper cultural etiquette did he offer Jesus. Jesus again calls the Pharisee out. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. Guys, this isn't a... No! It's continual. The feet are clean and she continues to kiss them. And you know what I think is going on here? Jesus, he's letting her, he's letting her adore him. He's not uncomfortable with it. He loves it when we worship him. And he's going to reciprocate her worship with salvation, with blessing, and with peace. And I thought about why is she continually kissing his feet? She's got them clean, and now she's going back and forth kissing the feet. Now, just one kiss would be plenty for me. Why does she continually kiss his feet? Because that's what the text says. She's not stopped kissing my feet, and I haven't stopped it. And I think this, Jesus alludes to this. Much love and much adoration given to someone springs forth from much forgiveness and much freedom that is received from someone. This woman is about to receive the forgiveness of her sins and the freedom from her old life. And guess what? She is going to offer him extreme adoration, continual kissing. Her sins are many. You know, I could say... Many of us say our sins are many. This woman's sins were many and they were dark. And I'm thinking perhaps at each kiss, you know what that is? It's an act of worship and it's an act of celebration. Sin removed. Sin removed. Thank you, Lord. Sin removed. Oh, my sins are removed. I'll tell every believer here today, you might think this odd to say, Jesus is worthy of your kiss of worship every day. That's hard to fathom in our culture, but I'm telling you it's straight up true. Now she's going to hit the home run. Now she's going to knock it out of the park. And she's going to bring an offering to Jesus. This prostitute does. Let's talk about the offering. It was customary to pour some fragrant oil over the head of a guest that enters your home. It was a sign of respect. It was also a sign of cleansing. Hey guys, they didn't take showers every day like we did. Taking a bath was a rare occasion. Jesus walks miles and miles and miles every day. He might be a little sweaty. So what they do, they just drizzle a little oil on your head. It would help soothe your hair. And guess what? It smelled good. It was a sign of affection. The Pharisees saw no need to anoint the head of Jesus. You know why? He knew not who sat at his table. The prostitute did. To Simon, he says again, You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. (laughs) Not just on my head, she's anointing my feet with fragrant oil. It's expensive. And I think we see the generosity of her worship. Guys, are we generous in our worship? Do we just come on Sunday for this one hour? Lord, here's my hour of worship. Or are we generous? Do we give it to him day after day after day, hour after hour? Are we in a continual mode of worship? We're called to that. Just as she is generous with her tears, she's generous with her kisses, she's also generous with very expensive, fragrant oil. As she continually pours it over the feet of Jesus, rubbing it in. You know, my wife wants a foot rub all the time with some oil. This is what's going on, honey, right here. Maybe I need to glean from them. Maybe my application is to to rub your feet like the sinful woman did for Jesus. You ready for that? I know you are. You know what? Unknowingly, this... The sinful woman, she is anointing Jesus. She is anointing the King of Kings, and she is anointing the feet that will be nailed to a cross. She's preparing him for the sacrifice. The prostitute, that's called grace. Guys, you want to have a personal experience with Jesus? Offer him your heart and all of it. And do it every morning. Break open the vial. Break open the alabaster jar of your heart. And let it flow. You know, I think Jesus was the the center of attention that evening. Hey, he's the guest. Let's see what he has to say. Let's figure him out. But after the breaking of the alabaster jar with the fragrant oil, now it's filling the air. I think it's too much for the Pharisees. This woman is still weeping and crying and anointing feet. All this going on. The attention, okay, we've got to deal with this sinful woman now, Jesus. We've got to deal with her. And so now the Pharisee speaks up. 
And I've written on here, guys, danger, 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 religion. Not what God has done for you, but what you can do for God and what you can do for others. That's religion. Beware of it. When the Pharisee who had invited him, Jesus, saw this, what did he see? Extreme worship. Bowing, kneeling, caressing, kissing, adoring. He said to himself, you guys have done this. You said this. Oh, I, I can't believe so and so is asleep right now, right? <laughs> so he said this to himself. If this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is. She is a sinner. Oh, the judgmental glares of the religious. I pray that it never happens that someone comes into this worship service and gets a religious glare. Please, never partake of that sin. You know, if you could see the Pharisee's body language right now, you know what it is. It's some of this. It's eye rolling. It's lip curling. It's head shaking. It's disgust. This woman's a prostitute. She shouldn't be here. Why are you allowing her to touch your body? Jesus, you're unclean now. And so we, now we see the intent of the Pharisee. His intent that evening had nothing to do with worshiping Jesus and are you truly a prophet or the Son of God but rather it was to question Jesus and see how he would react to religion. And he saw it. And then the Pharisees made a judgment. And here's the judgment. Jesus is not a prophet of God. He is not from God. He is not the Messiah. And that sinful woman is still a sinful woman. That's their judgment at the dinner table. How uncomfortable might that be? I must remind everyone here today. We all came from this place and sometimes we all fall into it for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of god we're all sinners saved by grace and there's a good chance next week you're probably going to sin so brothers and sisters we do not condone sinful behavior we don't celebrate it no we don't but i will tell you beware of your christianity being grounded in religion than your relationship with jesus I'm all for doctrine, but your purest doctrine is found in the life and words of Jesus. I'm going to remind everyone here this morning, you are called, if you are a Christ follower, you're called to worship Jesus on a personal level every day. Have you been partaking of that worship service? Monday morning, there should be a worship service. It's yours. I'm going to close with this. Johnny, come on up. Praise Ben. Really, this story of, of um, worship, it has a second story. It's really a story of religion versus relationship. We see a woman who's seeking a relationship with God, and she finds it. She finds it in repentance. She finds it in confession. She finds it in following Jesus. She is forgiven by the blood of Christ. She's saved by the grace of God and her faith. We're told that. Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Guys, the woman is not saved by her torrent of tears. The woman is not saved by her adamant adoration of Jesus. That does not save her. Her kneeling, her weeping, the washing of the feet, the gift of anointing oil... That was not disregarded by Jesus at all. He appreciated the worship. He enjoyed the worship. He treasured the worship. And I will tell you something we don't hear much about, but this woman was rewarded for this worship. We will all stand before the beam of seat of Christ to be judged what will be done in the body, both good and, good and bad. And this woman, she is rewarded by her act of worship. Guys, you'll be rewarded, I believe, how well, how often did you worship the Messiah? If you blew them off, they'll be less rewarding. If you're all into worship, you're going to be rewarded. Really, the things that she partook in, the kneeling, the adoring, the kissing, the anointing, they were evidence of her newfound faith and it's proven by her heart of worship. This woman, this prostitute was saved by grace by her faith, not by her works, not by her adoration. Yet, James, the little brother of Jesus, wrote this, faith without deeds is dead. There is a true faith 
and there is a fake faith according to the Bible. We are saved by faith alone and grace, and yet it's a faith that is proven by good works, and I believe it's a faith that's proven by worship. I love this story today, uh, that really when I see this sinful woman, there's no hesitation to forgive her. There's no shortage of forgiveness. There's no reason for Jesus to not spend time with her. And so I'll ask you this morning, what was your intention this morning with Jesus when you came here to the church service? Was it to worship Him? Was it hear music? What was it? To, was it to have breakfast? What was your intention when you came here this Sunday morning? Is it to worship? What is your intent for your life? Is your intention, do you want to know Jesus? Actually, the question is, do you know Jesus personally, or do you just know about Him? If you just know about Him, that's not good enough. Your religion is not good enough. Your attendance is not good enough. Your taking of communion is not good enough. Your service can't save you. Only a simple surrender, like that of a sinful woman who sought out Jesus, fell at his feet, and she said, I need you, I want you, I follow you. That's it. If you've never made that decision, I'm going to challenge someone today. If you've never made a true decision to follow Jesus, and you're thinking about it, come to the altar and let's pray about it. Here's your challenge for this week, Christ followers. I'm going to give you one challenge. Here it is. And I'll say if you're physically able to do this. One day this week. One morning this week. I'm just asking for one morning. And it could be for one minute. That's all I'm asking. I'm going to ask you to get on your knees and kneel before God. I'm going to ask you to get on your knees and kneel before God, your maker, your savior, and worship him. You could play a song. You could read a scripture, you could pray, you can be quiet, but I'm asking you to get on your knees and worship him, bow down to lift him up. We are not too good for that. It's not too religious. It's not too charismatic. It's called worship. And I'm really going to challenge the men today as well. That's right, men... We're called to lead our families. Are we leading our families? One of the best ways to lead your families is for your wife or your daughter to see you're on knees praying. Men, step it up. Let's allow our families to see us worship the one true Savior. So the altar is always open this morning. I'm going to open it up again. It's a call to the altar. If anyone is in here today and you're in need of prayer for healing, if you're in need of prayer for salvation, if you want to come up and just worship Jesus on your knees, come on up. It's open. You know, we hear, we hear that phrase, that still small voice. Everybody here today, you're hearing a still small voice. It's called the Holy Spirit. Some of you are hearing, give your life to Jesus. Some of you are hearing, maybe stay seated. Some are hearing, come to the altar and pray. I would tell you this morning, listen to the voice, that still small voice that speaks to you. And I would love to have a time of worship at the altar. And I will tell you, as I'm up here, I'm going to drop to my knees, because I'll tell you what, last Sunday I told Johnny and Jess this. The last song, I'm standing here, and this is what happens to the American culture. I hear the Spirit of God say, Steve, drop your knee, and I didn't do it. Well, I'm doing it today. Who's with me?